lift your voice, praise him. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Heaven is in this place. Heaven is in this place. Down their golden crown. Love 
perfect in power, love and purity. Yeah. Yes, Lord. You're the Lion of Judah, the Lamb who was slain. You ascended to heaven and evermore will reign. At the end of the age when the earth you reclaim, you will gather the nations before you. And the eyes of all men will be fixed on the Lamb who was crucified. For with wisdom and mercy and justice you reign at your Father's side, and the angels will cry, Hail the Lamb, who was slain for the world, ruling power, and the earth will reply. Sing it, ladies, come on. Hallelujah. Here we go. There's a shield in our hands and a sword in our side. There's a fire in our spirit that cannot be denied. As the Father has told us, for these you have died. For the nations that gather before you. And the ears of all men need to hear of the Lamb who was crucified. Descended to hell, yet was raised up to reign at your father's side, and the angels will cry. Sing that again. Oh, yeah! Sing with me. There's a shield in our hands. There's a shield in our hands and a sword at our side. There's a fire in our spirits that cannot be denied. As the Father has told us, for these you have died. For the nations to gather before you. And the ears of all men need to hear of the Lamb who was crucified. Who descended to hell yet was raised up to reign at your Father's side. And the angels will cry.
My heavens, I, I, I'm letting Bill play tonight because I just can't stay behind this keyboard. <laughs> Glory. Go to D. When you don't know what to do, just go to D and wait. Woo, I don't know where you're from tonight. You may be evangelical, you may be Pentecostal, you may be charismatic, you may be Catholic. Let's just, let's sum it all up in three. You're either charismatic Pentecostal, the strange folks, are you evangelical? Are you liturgical? And then all of you are Christians. And the ones... And the ones who are not, the ones who are not in this place tonight, you have an opportunity before you leave. To get in. You have a chance to get in on the best thing that you could ever find in your entire life. Now, not religion, because religion just makes one sour. Jesus makes one free. So, whatever the branch of the body of Christ you're from, see, we learned, we've learned something. We've learned that we all need each other. We all need each other. I love the liturgical church. They know something about the Father that I've never learned in the reverence of Him that I never learned in my Pentecostal church. They know about the table of the Lord and the Eucharist and coming before the Lord and the table of the Lord, things that we Pentecostals could used to learn a whole lot about. The Lord has given the evangelical church a wonderful revelation of the friendship of Christ and how that you can know Jesus personally that you can walk with him and have a relationship with him. But I want to tell you something. All of us together make up one body. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Now, that was my qualification. I want to sing one more song because I got to sing in that little song. I brought that back from the, from the United Kingdom, and, and they sing that a lot over there, and they sing it a lot in um, Ireland. It was written in Ireland, matter of fact. It kind of has an Irish thing, doesn't it? But when I got to singing that, the very first time, we got to that part, and the angels would cry, Hail the Lamb. And I just saw millions upon millions falling before the Lord and just saying, Hail the Lamb. And I could just see the praises of God's people encircling the globe. And being Pentecostal, I felt the need to dance. Now... What I'm about to sing, it's easy to dance to, but that song, you kind of look goofy. If you want to make that sound more proper, you look a little bit foolish when you dance to a six, eight time song because it's kind of a waltz. And how do you waltz gracefully when you're excited about the world worshiping Jesus? So, <laughs> so here I am with all of these Englishmen who are a little bit more reserved than I am. And I, we hit that hail the lamb, and I came apart. <laughs> and, and just started dancing across the front like a foolish, and, and finally composed myself and thought, you know, I've got to go sit down. This is foolish. I mean, I've really made a fool of myself. These people thought I, maybe I had something to say. I've not made Brownsville look good at all. <laughs> this is not good. When I got back to the stage, I noticed that there were several other people that were just as foolish as I, and they had evidently got the same revelation that I had. And they were worshiping the Lord. I want to sing one more chorus, and I want to tell you why I want to sing it. 
Because when I sing songs about the world worshiping God, I, when I sing songs about humanity and, and kings and, and, and powerful men around the world bowing before the name of Jesus, you see, that's the kingdom of the Lord. And I get to thinking about how good that's going to be just to know that the one that I love, my Jesus that saved me and, and forgiven me for so much, and, and he's brought me out of darkness and given me a reason to live and a smile on my face and a spring in my step. I was nothing. I was going around destroying myself. I was on my way to hell. I didn't have any hope for tomorrow. And then I met Jesus, and he, he gave me a reason to live and a reason to sing. And a reason to dance. <laughs> and so when I start singing about all these people just loving on the one that I love, I just think of all the love he's going to get. And I just come apart. I can't help it. So that's the reason I like to sing songs like this. The Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. The Lord
You know, they tell us that us Christians are in the minority, but we, I sure don't feel like a loser tonight, do you? Oh, hallelujah. It's yes. great to be on the Lord's side. We welcome you here in the name of the Lord. You're working now. All right, this thing got anointed. Yes, Praise God. <laughs> in heaven, there will be no electronics. But there'll be something. There's going to be something. There's going to be noise, but no electronics. Yes. Well, we're glad you're here tonight, and we bless you in the name of the Lord, and we just want you to be blessed, and you've already been blessed. I got in a little bit late uh, because of some other things that I was having to do in back, and uh, came out here, and I could just see the glory of the Lord on everybody's face, and it's, you know, you just walk in here, and God's here. Hallelujah. It's wonderful. Wonderful. We had a lot of rain today. I was sitting in my office, and uh, I've got a leak in there, and we... We're in the process of getting that fixed, but um, uh, I was looking out the window and I thought, boy, it must have been something like this during Noah's day. 
It, it was pretty bad there for a while. Before I left this morning, uh, they, I had my yard landscaped a few w uh, months ago, and um, some water broke through. I live on a hillside, and some water broke through and started washing away my landscape. My wife came uh, in and said, come out on the back here and look at this. And it was just washing away all those bar pine barks and pine needles and everything that uh, they'd put there. And this is sandy soil down here, folks, so when a wash starts, I mean, it washes. And she said, what are you going to do? And I said, nothing. It's pouring rain out there. <laughs> I mean, it was pouring down. So um, after the rain's over, we'll have to get a landscaper back out there. Steve, Jess, you're in here somewhere. I know you're licking your chops. <laughs> he's our landscape man. So he's, he's glad to hear that, I'm sure. For years, revival has been a burning passion of mine, as it has with many here. I was completely convinced that the only hope for our nation and the only way to see the fulfillment the Great Commission was with sweeping revival. The church at cer certain times has crawled along. If you go back 500 years ago, a thousand years ago, it's amazing how much the church and true believers were crawling along and sometimes even to find a remnant on fire for God is difficult. But the good news is that around the earth today, God is moving in unprecedented ways. Every week uh, on Tuesday nights, or at least most Tuesday nights, I do a, a chat on, um, uh, on the internet talking about revival issues. And someone said they heard a statistic from someone who had spoken here once, and that the, according to the statistic, there were 150,000 people being saved every day around the world. And could I verify that? And I was sad to tell them that the only statistic I had, that I had through the years found through a, a church statistician, was that it was about 75,000, only 75,000 people being saved a day. Of course, that was a few years ago and things are heating up, but there are generations, a whole generation would go by and they would barely see 75,000 or 150,000 or 500,000 people saved. And now around the world, God is building this church. And I want to encourage you with something. I was just looking out during the worship and I, I spotted a few people and I want you to know one of the great reasons for our joy here in the revival. Yes, it's wonderful to be in the presence of God and His presence is fullness of joy. That's a reason for rejoicing. But another reason for rejoicing is the Word says there's great joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. And when you see multiplied thousands of sinners repenting week in, week out, you better believe there's reason to rejoice. And then when you see those sinners going on with God, getting on fire for God, bringing their families to Jesus, bringing their friends to Jesus, out on the mission field now, doing the work of God, you have even more reason to rejoice. As I looked out tonight, I, I just, my eye caught a few different people rejoicing in the Lord, and I, I just want them to come up for a minute because I want you to know what God is doing in this building, and it's just part of what He's doing around the world. But uh, Gary, come on up here. Just come on up for one second. And Alex, Hisham, come on up. And uh, let's see, is Janet anywhere? Our favorite Methodist, is she around anywhere? She's here. And uh, you weren't in a gang before you were saved, were you? No? All right. We have any former gang members here? Sometimes we have whole contingents, sort of. All right, well, here, you come on up here, Gary. Come on up here. These, uh, these folks have something uh, wonderful in common. Uh, Gary here is a Jewish man, and um, our friend Hisham here was a Druze Muslim from Lebanon. And uh, the one nice thing they have in common is at these altars, they both got saved here in this revival. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and our, our brother here, uh, when was it that you came to the Lord? Uh, Jan uh, <laughs> November 5th. November 5th. Steve, you remember the testimony that when he got baptized, he was amazed that Jesus would accept him. And uh, does your father know yet? Yeah, he does. How did he respond? Not very well. <laughs> <laughs> See, Druze Muslims, I mean, this goes back generation after generation after generation. It's deep. The blood is very thick. Uh, and uh, God had mercy. Changed your life, didn't he? Yeah, greatly, greatly. <laughs> and um, I don't know if you know something here, Gary. Uh, Gary's wife sings in the choir. Could you just wave your hand here? Um, she was in such deep depression 
And for two years before she got saved, she basically laid on the couch with the cover over her head, waiting to die. I, I would call that depression, wouldn't you? Deep depression. And when God turned her around through the revival, it, it got our friend Gary here thinking more seriously about really following Jesus. And, and what happened to you? My life was transformed in a moment. And just, I went from hardly even believing that God existed to being so on fire for Jesus. I saw a miracle, a miracle here at the revival. And it's much more than my wife being in deep depression. She had been in and out of mental hospitals for 15 years and jails and rehabs. The doctors had given up all hope. They've said, we can either lock you up because you're psychotic and violent, or we can zap your brain with electroshock, but there's no hope at all. And right here, right here, in front of my eyes, she was healed, just healed. Yes, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Glory. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. I'll say something else. And I know now, and I know now that Jesus came to this earth for me. And I had my whole life, and I just was told, no, that's for the Christians. It's only for the Gentiles. But I know now that everything he did for did 2,000 years ago for me right here at Brownsville. Hallelujah. Bless you, Lord. One thing you may not know, Gary, uh, he was baptized at the end of our pastor's conference in November. And uh, I guess within one week of when you were baptized, he saw him. Uh, we had uh, some workers here, one an Israeli, one an American who had lived in Israel for years. They're laboring among Israelis in Los Angeles. And the Israeli brother, his name is actually Israel, he was overcome with a burden for his own people. And it's been tough sledding, reaching out to Israelis living in Los Angeles, to about 40,000 of them. And he pleaded with the Lord before the baptism that night, God, if you're going to do something among the Israelis in Los Angeles, let a Jew be baptized tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. And uh, just, just tell us out of the horse's mouth what, what happened. Where the, the darkness to light in your own life. I know you used to be shy before, but Jesus changed that too, I think. Well, I've really never been that shy. <laughs> um, it's just that I had been, uh, I had grown up with a lot of abuse in uh, my life, and I really became angry. And then I started being repressed and withdrawn and just lost all faith. I grew up in a Pentecostal church, but I left it. And I just got out in the world. There was just a lot of things in my family that happened, and I was just overwhelmed with all the pain and misery. And, uh, but you know, I always knew, and I always had that little faith in me, you know, that, you know, if I kept praying to God, kept praying to God, that someday he would answer my prayer. And the funniest thing, uh, when my first husband, the one that was, I was in an abusive relationship with, he actually abandoned uh, my whole entire family, my, myself and my two children. For 10 years I stayed single because I did not want anything else to do with men, positively not. But I did keep praying. I said, God, please, please bring me a good Christian man, please. And I meet Gary, and he's Jewish. <laughs> And I said, God, what are you trying to tell me? Well, just a few years later, it all came into light, especially when he got saved. And then here we are at Brownsville, the most exciting place in the world. Our, our lives, we are so happy and so blessed every day. It's just remarkable. I started making, a, I've, I've come up with a journal you know, uh, to keep all these things. I can't remember them all, how, you know, because they come to me so fast about all these blessings. But when I was that sick and Gary drug me down here, you know, I was just so oppressed. And like I say, I'd given up all hope. And uh, I came in and it just seems like the minute I stepped over the threshold, I started being lifted up. It was like I was into another dimension. 
And then I came in here and heard the uh, uh, Steve speaking on who are you going to serve. And I mean, I sobbed through the whole uh, sermon. I didn't even think I'd even been able to, to hear of it, any of it, but I did hear it because it softened my heart. And I stepped out of Satan's bondage that night. Huh. I have never, I don't believe in my whole adult life, had freedom. And uh, I mean, I just was set free. And I mean to tell you, it is wonderful. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I don't want you to feel left out if you're not Jewish or if you're not Muslim, all right? I see that this man was a Jewish Muslim, now he's a follower of Jesus. This man was an unbelieving Jew, now he's a believing Jew. But uh, Janet, just come on over here for one second. Janet was a local Methodist, but she was not a saved Methodist, is that right? I heard a guy on the radio today and he wants to start trying to clone babies and he said, now let it be understood, I am a Christian. I'm a Methodist. I believe in God, and I believe that man will become God. Good Christian. But uh, Janet, what was your life like before you got saved? Um, I went to church every Sunday because my mom said that that's what we were going to do, and um, I would just sit in church for a whole hour and just re- <laughs> And um, write notes to my friends on the little money envelopes and um... <laughs> how, you don't have to confess, but how many have done the same thing? Don't, don't raise your hands. All right. Hands went up anyway. All right. And um, but when I went home and went to school, I was like a totally different person. I was, I acted really good at church, but then when I went to school, I would cuss and um, always try to look for boyfriends and everything else. and. I never really did anything with them because um, I knew that my mom would really get me. And, and, um, but I would just cuss and disrespect my teachers and yell at my mom and dad and just act totally wrong. You got saved right at the beginning of the revival, right? What happened to you? Well, my youth pastor brought us here um, because um, um, a friend of um, her daughter's, Katie Ward, and their family, they, um, they told us what was happening to their church. And then, so she brought us here the Sunday after Father's Day. And um, I had never been in a church this big before, and I was like, whoa. And we, we, we came in here, and that was when um, there wasn't any chairs, and there, there was only about maybe 500 people in here. And um, they were like all dancing around and lifting their hands. And I was like, what is going on here? And, and it was just, the service just went on and on and on and on. That, that, that was a long time ago. It doesn't really happen like that anymore. It just, we just don't stop anymore, basically. And um, they sang for like oh, an hour. And I was like, man, I've never sang so much in my life. And then Steve got up here, and um, I had never seen a preacher preach where they moved away from the pulpit. And <laughs> and he, I don't remember what he was preaching, but he was preaching against sin, and um, <laughs> and um, he gave the altar call, which I had never heard about an altar call or seen an altar call before, but he just made it really plain to us. And um, we were sitting in the balcony and um, I didn't want to come forward because I thought it was saved because, you know, I was a Methodist and I was in a Pentecostal church and I didn't have to get saved in a Pentecostal church. I had never even heard of the Assemblies of God before until I came here. And, but I just saw, you know, when I came and I saw these people dancing, I was like, man, these people are too weird for me. And so then after that, they started praying for people, and then all these people started falling on the floor and shaking and all this, and I was like, what is going on here? And then my twin brother, he came before me, and he's about six foot two or so, and um, he told me I had to come to church, and 
I was like, you don't even talk to me. What are you doing? And so he brought me down here too. And he got prayed for first and Steve prayed for him and he fell right in my feet. And I went, ah! and I ran out that back door right there. I, I just want to say to all the pastors here who are a little stiff, there's hope for you too, brothers. But before I could get away, my youth pastor grabbed me and she pulled me right back over, over there. And um, then Steve came walking towards me and he would take a step forward and I would take a step back and I was like, and I was like, please don't touch me. And, and he was very, very kind and gentle. And, he just took my hands and, and he said, I just want to pray a blessing over you. I was like, I was like, okay. And so he said, may the Lord bless. And when he got there, I was thrown to the ground. And, and I got up and I was drunk so bad. And... <laughs> my youth pastor... She said that my eyes were all glazed, and I had never drank anything in my whole life. And she said my eyes were glazed over, and I would walk around in this aisle like all crooked and stuff. And I was like that for three weeks. And then, <laughs> luckily, luckily it was in the summertime, so I didn't have to go to school and explain myself. But then one day, then one day he prayed for me, and I started jerking like that and I was like well this is kind of you know I just thought it was all weird but I believed it and then I was thinking oh my gosh I have to go to gymnastics practice tomorrow and I've been a gymnast for 14 years and I'd always had control of myself you know I was very you know gymnast you know and I could always stand on my two feet and here I was jerking and so I went up to the platform right here and Steve was standing there and I was like excuse me um my name is Janet, and I'm training for the Junior Olympics. And I was just wondering, am I going to be doing this tomorrow? <laughs> and and he, he hugged me, and he prayed peace over me, and it stopped. And I was like, thank you so much. <laughs> and he, sa he said, if it ever, if it started happening tomorrow on the way to gym, just pray peace over yourself. And if it doesn't stop, just call the church, and they'll call me, and I'll call you back, and we'll pray. <laughs> so then... <laughs> By the way, this is my first time hearing the story also, so I'm... <laughs> and, um, so then I went home and I looked up Brownsville's number in the phone book and I started memorizing it just in case I needed it. Because <laughs> I was really scared because I never shared about Jesus or about any of this kind of stuff in my life, so I'm driving to gym and I parked the car, turned off the key, and I started jerking. And I was like, oh my gosh, I was like, peace, 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 peace. I didn't know what to pray. I didn't know what to pray, so I was like, peace, peace, and it didn't stop. And so I just kind of hugged myself and I'm walking in the gym and I'm going like that. And the more I held it, the, more it, the worse it got. And I was like, okay, when I get inside the door, I'm going to call. And I was like, four, three, I don't know. And so I opened the door and it totally stopped. And I was like, praise God, praise God. I'm like yelling in the gym and they've never heard a word about God or nobody from me. And I was like, praise God. And my coach said, are you okay? I was like, praise God, praise God. Hallelujah. But by, by the way, it, it looks like God has his ways of getting praises out of us. And, uh, what happened in your heart though? What happened about the, the change of life? Um, the cussing stopped and um, I went home that night and my mom had not gone with me that night. Um, well, we just went with my aunt and my mom said she figured that she could um, trust my youth pastor because she was also my aunt. So we came home at like 3 in the morning and she was like, where have y'all been? And I was like, mom, I can't really explain it right now but we've been to church and she was like, are you crazy? And she called my aunt to make sure that we were really at church. And then me and my brother, who we always fought like cats and dogs. And, um, and we went up in my room that night. And for like the next two weeks or so, like every night when we would come home, because it was every night back then, and, um, and we would just read the Bible just for hours till like five or six in the morning. And my mom was like, 
one time she came back in the in the living room and upstairs we had like a little balcony and my light was on and she was like what are you guys doing you better go to bed i was like mom we're almost finished with this chapter just wait a second and we just kept reading and reading she's like what are y'all reading i was like the bible duh and she <laughs> So because, of, because me and my brother started reading the Bible, then she came and then she ended up getting saved. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You know, the one thing we always tell people, it doesn't matter if you shake or fall, the question is, how do you live when you get out the doors here? How do you live when you get out the doors? And God had his way of getting hold of, of each of these dis different people here. And uh, I just looked out and saw him worshiping, and I thought, that, that's the miracle that causes us to rejoice. Jesus said, the harvest is the end of the age. We're living in awesome days of harvest. And the good news in particular is that God is radically and supernaturally changing people by the power of the gospel. Not just words, but the word coming in power, meeting people right where they are, some who didn't have a clue about Jesus, radically saving them, pushing them forward in the kingdom of God. So lift your heart, rejoice. The work of God is moving forward. Amen? Amen. Amen. You can be seated, folks. And just one quick announcement. If you're here to be registering for our school of ministry, you've... Amen. I think we've registered about our first uh, 330 for this semester, uh, but we're only about halfway through registration. So if you haven't registered yet, make sure you come by. Don't wait for Monday when it will be specially crowded. Come by tomorrow or Friday. If you need more info on the school, grab a brochure on the way out. And if you want to know one of the keys to ongoing revival, be here tomorrow at 11 o'clock for a special session on prayer. Prayer and intercession relative to revival. We have a teaching on that every Thursday at 11. And then Friday, I'll be doing a special session for leaders at 11. So we welcome you here. Get everything you can from God. The Lord will touch you and change you. Why don't you stand to your feet? Hallelujah. He has anointed you to preach good news. The Spirit of the Sovereign God is upon you. Because He has anointed you to preach good news. He has sent you to the poor. Bind up the broken heart to bring freedom to the captive and release the ones in darkness. Yeah. 
save Muslims, you can save Jews, Lord. You set the religious free, Lord Jesus. We glorify you, Lord. We glorify you. We glorify you. There's nothing you can't do. Nothing you can't do, Jesus. What everyone's standing, you know, I don't know if Mike realized by bringing that group of people up here, the spectrum that, um, that was brought before this congregation and those of you watching at home and listening, the, the uh, cross-section of individuals, Muslims, Jews, the religious, the drug addict. You think about the people that were up there, uh, pretty much touches this society. And for those of you that are believing God for someone in your family and you just can't imagine it happening, let this be a seed, okay? And sometimes you get so close to your family members and your loved ones and your, your neighbors that you just can't imagine them getting saved. But see, God imagines them saved, okay? God, God can see that. I've shared uh, in this revival over the last, last, last week and this week, I, my brother has been so, um, so on my mind because my brother George, uh, I've shared here, he, as a matter of fact, he's been here in the revival many times uh, and, and been, uh, he was baptized up here. He's been in many services, and uh, he, he worked with the Grateful Dead. My, my brother was one of those that I knew would never get saved. How many got, you know, people like that? You just know they're never going to get saved. He's brilliant. He was classified a genius by the state of Alabama. The University of Alabama classified him a genius, genius in Tuscaloosa at the university. And, and, and when I got saved, he called me a fool. He moved to California, uh, joined up with the Grateful Dead, just a brilliant, brilliant individual. Um, but um, and religion, as a matter of fact, we didn't talk for 10 years. He didn't speak to me for 10 years. That's how far uh, gone we were after, because we both did drugs together before. And after I got saved, he didn't want anything to do with me. And uh, my brother was baptized right there. Yes. 
a couple months ago. He, my whole family's been either saved or gotten on fire in this revival, my whole family. And it, now he's bringing in my extended family, my cousin who used to rob with me. We used to deal drugs and all and break in places. He's going to the, the school of ministry. He's gotten on fire in this revival. So, but I got a, a, a letter from my brother. And uh, you read it, and it starts off like, um, uh, Dear family, well, praise the Lord. It's been a wonderful year. And I'm going, George? And he goes, it's so blessed to wake up in the morning. He lives out in the uh, Sierras, out in uh, Northern California, outside of Frisco. And he says, it's so wonderful to wake up in the morning and, and, and hear the birds sing and, 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 uh, be, and, and have Jesus in your home and Jesus in your heart. And, and I'm reading this going, this is not George. This is, this is awesome. But I'm sharing that for those of you in this place that you can't imagine your loved one being saved. He was like that. If you followed the dead, you know anything about the grateful dead? They're not into Jesus. Okay? And my brother was so far from God, and he's so into Jesus now, it's scary. And he's solid. I mean, he's solid as a rock growing in God in a good church out there. I just want to share that with you as a word of encouragement. And these testimonies should be a word of encouragement to you. No matter who it is, no matter where they are, what they've gone through, God can save them. God can set them free. God can build a fire under them. We believe you, Jesus. We believe you, Jesus. We believe you, Jesus. And before you're, before you're seated, and I want to say this to those of you at home also, there is an anointing. Those of you that were watching Janet's and listening to Janet's story, the Methodist, there's an anointing. What happened when she was prayed for? You know, how could a skeptic, and that's basically what she was, how can God get a hold of a skeptic? God can do that the same way he got a hold of Saul of Tarsus. God can do what he wants. He got a hold of Janet immediately, okay? After that, she was a fanatic. You see the change? You know? She was, out, she, she was in, that, in that drunken state in the spirit for three weeks. What was that? That was God getting a hold of Janet, saying, Janet, I've got a plan for you. Now, I'm going to slap you silly for a few weeks so you'll understand that, okay? I'm going to take total control of you for several weeks, and then you're going to be so sold out, you're going to read your Bible till 5 in the morning. You're going to be so on fire, and Janet, by the way, is in the Revival School of Ministry. She's going on with God, but that's what God's doing to a lot of folks. Tonight, in a few minutes, we're going to begin praying. We're going to pray for you. We have a large prayer team. The pastors will be praying. There is an anointing. There is an anointing. I don't know exactly how it all works, friend. I'm not God. I don't understand the ways of the Lord. I know down in Argentina there's been a great revival since 1984. When I moved to Argentina with my family, the first thing I did was go after the anointing there. All right, is anybody listening? There were people being mightily used of God. They were waving their hands across crowds of 10, 15, 20,000, and the demon-possessed were being delivered. As far as the eye could see, people were screaming out. They were, were being set free from demons. No one touching them. And when I saw that, I wanted that power. You may not be like that, but I wanted that because I knew that was Jesus. I knew that was that silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. And there is an anointing here. The power of God is in this place, so be prayed for in a few minutes. Be prayed for. You never know when or what God's going to do in your life. Just constantly go after Him. I want everyone standing. We're going to pray that the Lord would speak to our hearts and change our lives. I want everyone to pray this, even if you're a skeptic in this room. If you're not a believer, if you're sitting here and you're basically a snot, somebody brought you here, you don't want to be here, you just... I've gotten three letters this week from snots, and then that's why it's just fresh on my mind. And they all said I was a snot, so they, they were, these were former snots that were testifying. <laughs> they were <laughs> from snot to saint, yeah. But they, they, all these people, all these people were testifying how they came here as a snot, didn't want anything to do with God or this place, and now they're transformed. So I want the snots to pray. I want everyone in this place to pray this prayer out loud. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus speak, to my heart, speak to my heart. Change my life. Change my life. In, your precious name, in your precious name, amen. amen. You may be seated. 
I love this revival. Don't you love this revival, Richard? I love this revival, man. It's awesome. It is awesome. I got a letter from a, um, here's a lady that got so messed up here. She's, um, let's see, she got messed up when she was 79, I think, here. Yeah, here it was. I was 79 when I came to your revival. <laughs> this is so good, man. She said, um, she said, I've been in the assemblies of God all my life. I taught Sunday school for 40 years. So I asked God, why is he doing this? She got zapped here at the revival. She said, it's time for me to retire in my comfortable little rut. She said, it's time to let somebody else do it, God, 79. But God had different plans for me. I met him in his awesome power at Brownsville. 79 years old. She goes on to say that she's come out of retirement. She's on fire for God now. Lord will mess up your life, friend. 79. God, why don't you let somebody else do it? I don't think so. We get mail, friend. I love this mail. It's, it's, it's something else. And when God moves in your life, write us. Let us know what God's doing, especially when you get back. We get letters from all over the world. And uh, we had uh, newspaper articles from all over the world that you can't understand them. You know, they send them to you and say, you just wanted you to get this article. And it's two or three pages and all these pictures of what's going on at Brownsville. And they'll go, it'll go, no, 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 not Steve Hill. No, 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 not John Kilpatrick. No, no. <laughs> Japanese, Chinese, all these. But, uh, hallelujah. Whew. I began a message on Saturday that uh, I believed I was basically finished with it and the Lord has spoken to me this morning that uh, I am to complete it tonight and just do an overview of Saturday night. How many were not here Saturday night? That's one of the reasons why. <laughs> so. I really believe that it's decision time for hundreds and hundreds of people, really thousands, that are listening to this. You might be listening by radio or perhaps got this video and you may be in Japan, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Scotland, Ireland. We've had people here from Iceland, been here from all over the world. Over 110 nations, I believe, have come to this revival. And maybe you got a hold of this tape and you're wondering what God has in store for you through it. I want to say to you at the very beginning that uh, you're going to make a serious decision in just a minute. It's going to be a life decision. And it's about time some of us make these decisions. One of the reasons many of us struggle so much is because we haven't nailed down some fundamentals. The reason I don't go back to drugs is because I quit them 22 years ago, okay? When I quit them, I still liked them. Is anybody listening? When I quit drugs, I still loved alcohol. I still loved what morphine and heroin and the hard class A narcotics. I liked the way I felt when I did the drugs. I liked what it felt when I smoked pot. I liked partying, but I quit that. See, Jesus saved me. He set me free. And I made a decision 22 years ago to not go back to that stuff. But there's people here tonight, you haven't made that decision. You haven't made that decision. I'm going somewhere, so stay with me. This is so important for the beginning of this year. There are others here that you struggle with sexual sins. I got married 18 years ago. I want my wife to stand. Jerry, I love you, baby. 18 years ago, we have three kids. 18 years ago, when I married Jerry, it was for life. She was my love. 
She was going to be my girl the rest of my life. It was a decision. There's no other options. There's nothing else out there. Do you understand? But some of us in this room haven't done that. You haven't nailed that down and you've left a little door open here and a little window open there and that's why you struggle all the time. Some of you students that are going to the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry, if you don't do what I'm talking about tonight and finalize some of these things in your life, you'll struggle all the way through school. If you haven't gotten a hold of the sex problem in your life, you're going to sit there in class and be eyeballing some girl or some guy all the way through class. Why? Because you haven't dealt with obsession. And God could be moving mightily. Mike Brown could be teaching. The power of God's coming down. But you're sitting there in your little lust corner watching some girl. Why? You haven't dealt with some of the basics. And we're going to deal with those tonight just for a few minutes. Is that okay? Well, there's a lot of reasons people come to the Brownsville Revival. Some come here demanding to know, does God exist? There's people here tonight, you've come to this revival, and you're asking that question, is God real? People come from all over America. I remember one lady came in from New York City. She flew in because someone told her or she heard on the radio that God was moving down at Brownsville. So she flew down here with a thousand questions. If God's out there, is he real? You're here tonight. I know there's many people that are asking those questions. Others have come here tonight with serious life-controlling problems. You need healing. You need deliverance. And you need it now. There are people here that are bound in the very things that this woman was bound in. She was set free by the power of God right here. But you're still bound in drugs, alcoholism, or maybe you're bound with depression. You're here tonight and you've got to be set free. Others have come here because they're out of fellowship with God and you know in this place you're going to hear the truth. I'm going to say that again. People come here knowing that they're out of fellowship with God and if they'll get to the Brownsville Revival, somebody will shoot straight with them. I remember talking to a Nazarene man in Foley. I was over at the Riviera Center, which is like a, a, uh, a shopping mall. And, and this Nazarene, Nazarene man, a very handsome, well-dressed man, uh, probably in his mid-50s, early 60s, walked up to me. And he said, you're Steve Hill, aren't you? And I said, yes, I am. I was in shorts and a T-shirt, you know, just kicking around with my wife. And he said, he said, I just want to tell you something. What you're doing over there at Brownsville has changed my life changed my church and he said you're not afraid to tell the truth and we're not and pastors visiting you should never be afraid to tell the truth if you're not telling the truth you'll be held accountable on judgment day for it but you have come here, many have come here that you're, you've slipped away from God and you're asking yourself these questions, do I really know the Lord? Others have come here tonight because you made a decision several days ago at the turn of 1998, 1997 was closing, 1998 was a new baby, and you said on December 31st, in 1998, bless God, I'm going to get serious. I'm going to get serious about God. No more playing church. I'm going after him with all my heart, soul, and strength. And that's why you're here. I know that. I know you're here for those reasons. Other people have come. Christians come. Many Christians are here tonight. And you've come because you know there must be more than what you're experiencing. How many believe there must be more? We sing a song entitled, There Must Be More. See, I'm not satisfied, friend. I'm not satisfied. I believe, now you can call me a nut, I believe, Richard, that we should be able to speak to the dead. You can call me a fool for that, friend, but my Jesus did it, and I believe we're supposed to have power over the dead. Am I saying that every dead person's going to be raised up? No. I'm not saying that. They weren't in Jesus' time either. Of course, every funeral he went to, he messed up, but... Um, not everyone was raised from the dead during Jesus' time. But I believe we should have power of the dead. I would like to see more lame walk. I would like to see more blind as they're tapping their canes across the street. I'd like more Christians to walk up to them and say, Excuse me, would you like to be healed? But I want to tell you honestly why I believe, and Mike, this is, this is why I believe that it's not happening like it should be happening. I believe 
that the miracles have not come in the manner that God wants them to come because of this condition of his church. Because what would happen, Pastor, if a, a, the, 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 the town blind man, the one who everyone knew in the city was blind since birth, was suddenly healed in your church. Well, everyone would come from all the other states and from your city. Everyone would come to your church. What would they encounter? Stale Christianity? Two-timing Christians? What would they find in your church? So a man comes in, he hears a salvation message, he gets saved, he gets on fire for God. Who's he going to sit next to in your congregation? Some backslidden deacon? Some young person that's half in, half out? And so the Lord has got to get a hold of the church. I believe this, friend. I believe the Lord's got to get a hold of the church. The church has got to be on fire. The church has got to be smoking on fire for Jesus. I believe that. And I believe we're going to see more miracles. I really do. See, the early church had miracles, but the early church was ready. Man, they had laid a foundation. They were preaching the gospel. They were meeting in the houses. They had it going. They could incorporate new believers. Have you noticed how the, the Bible says, and 3,000 were added, 5,000 were added. These people were incorporated into the church. They were ready. They'd also heard about Ananias and Sapphira dropping dead in church. So they were a little um, hesitant before they joined. I wish we'd have more of that. This is, um, for those of you that were here Saturday, and just a couple of you were, this is uh, part two of Be It Resolved. I want everyone to say that with me, Be It Resolved. Be it resolved. One more time, Be It Resolved. Be it resolved. This is burning in my soul right now. Friends, friends, a resolution. We've all heard of the New Year's resolutions. I'm going much, much further than a New Year's resolution tonight. A resolution is a fixed purpose. It's a determination of your mind. It signifies a steadfastness or a consistency in execution. When someone says, I've made a resolve, I'm, this is a resolution, it means they're determined to do it. They're going to carry it out. I am privileged to work with a man by the name of Hector Ferreira who works in southern Argentina. Hector and I talk about every month. He calls me. We're buying a theater in Argentina. It's, uh, it's about $300,000. It's a theater in downtown, the downtown city of Chipolete. Hector and I made a, made a pact between us that we're going to buy that theater. And one of the things I never have to be concerned about with Hector, see I've worked with him for about 15 years now, I never have to be concerned about Hector is I, I know he is committed. He is committed to God. He's never going to call me up and say, Steve, I'm sorry, I'm backslid. Hector is on fire for Jesus. He's sold out. He's always fasting. He's always going after God because Hector, about 25 years ago, decided to follow Jesus, and he's never turned back. Don't you like people like that? I love people like that. It gives me the creeps to be around people. You've got to call them up and ask them how they're doing all the time. They've, they've known the Lord for 12 years, but you're still having to call them up and pamper them. You wonder if they're doing okay. When they walk into the room, you look at them and you, you they're, uh oh, they're depressed today. They're down today. You know, can't talk to Joe today. He didn't have a good day. You ever met people like that? I love to get around people even though they're having a rotten day. They're still saved, still on fire for God, still going after God. They've made a decision. Well, that's a resolution. It's firm. It's fixed. That's why this revival works. Let me just be blunt with you. That's why it works. It works because there's some men of God here that have made up their minds. We're not wishy-washy. Pastor John Kilpatrick stood right here at this platform and pointed his finger at his church. This was what Father's Day, wasn't it? Father's Day morning and said, this is it. Get in. What was that? A lot of pastors would go, just hold on, everybody. We're checking this out. You know, we'll see here. No, this is it. Get in. A few weeks later, he said this to the congregation. We're going after revival, and if you don't like it, there's the door. What is that? What is that? People can follow folks like that, friend. A sheep, a lamb can follow a shepherd like that. Well, I like that. He's going after revival. Okay, i got to make up my mind. Do I want revival or not? Do I want one-hour services like Janet talked about? Or am I, can, can I handle four and five hours? Am I going to pay the price? Am I going to be on the prayer team? 
These folks work, by the way. They work all day long, many of them. Some of them are housewives, but they work harder than their husbands as a housewife. And all the housewives said amen. amen. But uh, they work all day long, and then they come to the revival to work all night long. Why? They've committed themselves. They've committed themselves to the work. You with me tonight? Yeah. I hope so, friend, because God's going to come down in just a minute. There have been resolutions throughout American history. There was one made in 1798 in Virginia. And a resolution can be a one-on-one -on -one between a person and God. It can be a corporate thing. It can be when this church decided, for example, this church is building another building over here. We met together as, as a body and made a decision to build that building. It's a corporate thing. It's a resolution between all of us. Once we get going, let's go all the way up with it. Is everybody in favor? Yes, everyone's in favor. That's why the building's going up. Is this making sense? Yes. It is to me. In Virginia, in 1798, they said this, let it be resolved. Let it it's be it resolved now that the General Assembly of Virginia, we firmly make this resolution to maintain and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of this state against every aggression, either foreign or domestic, and that we will support the government of the United States in all measures warranted by the former. That means, friend, don't you come up against Virginia because when you come up against Virginia, you're coming up against that flag. And when you come up against that flag, you're coming up against what stands behind that flag, the declaration. You're standing behind why we were founded. We as a state of Virginia have made a resolution. We stand behind this. That's how this country was formed. When the war broke out in 1941 with Germany, we made this, it says, be it resolved, this was December 11th, 1941, by the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress. They had to take a vote. They had to come together and make a resolution that we will now declare war against Germany. It was a dead, it was a, it was a done deal. It was set, and they, they, they together authorized the president to, direct, to directly employ the entire Navy and all the military forces of the government to carry on war against the government of Germany. What was that? That was a resolution. They made a decision. America didn't sit back and go, well, I wonder if we're serious about this. No, it came from the top. The whole Congress said, the Senate said, we have resolved. This is war. It ain't going on no further. We're going to fight until we win. That's a resolution. Now stay with me, friend. Stay with me just a few minutes tonight because God's going to nail some stuff. I can feel this. Some of you have made New Year's resolutions. You've resolved to lose 25 pounds, to never use your credit card again. These are all good. To eliminate your debt, to spend time with your kids, to be on time, to be on time, to be on time. Why is it so hard for some of you to be on time? What is the problem? Where were you born? I'm, if you were born in Latin America, I can understand the tradition behind it all. In Latin America, the service starts at 7. Ahora. <laughs> that means now. But about 8, they come wandering in. Okay, I can understand that. So if I ever wanted to start at 7, I always said it now at 6 o'clock. We're going to start. But some of you made the resolution, I'm going to be on time in 1998. Those are decent resolutions. Some of you gave, made crazy resolutions, like to never eat chocolate again the rest of your life, or to never go one mile over the speed limit, or to wash my car every weekend, or to never become frustrated. But people that make resolutions that are serious do so because there's consequences. Stay with me, friends. We're fixing to get into the Scripture. It won't take long tonight. This is important. You're not going to stick with a resolution unless there's a consequence. I live for God because there's a consequence. If I don't live for God, I'm going to hell. Now, I love Jesus with all my heart, soul, and strength. But I know there's only two places, heaven and hell. If I don't live for God, I'm going to hell. I'm going to burn for eternity. If I don't work for God, I'm not going to get a crown. That means on that final day, those of you that are going to be crownless on that day, on that final day, we're going to be rewarded for what we did on this earth. 
That's why I work so hard. Because one day I want to get before the Lord and I want to kneel. Richard and I want him to set something on my head. And I don't want it to be made of cardboard. I don't want some paper Burger King crown set on my head. I want to stand before the Lord. I want to get on my knees. I want to get on my knees. And I know this is coronation day. I know millions are receiving their crowns. I don't know how it's all going to work, but there's no time in heaven. So it could take a couple million years. I don't know. It just doesn't matter up there. And he's going to place a crown on my head. And I want it to be a star-studded crown. I want it to be full of jewels and emeralds and diamonds and platinum and gold and inlaid silver. I want it to be an awesome crown. And as he places it on my head, I want to take the crown and push it off. And I want Jesus to press it back on, and then I'm going to push it back off. He's going to press it back on, and I'm going to push it off. And then I'm going to throw it at his feet. And I'm going to say, Jesus, worthy, 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 worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain on Calvary. You see, my friend, I want to give him back something. What are you going to throw at his feet? That's what I did on this earth. The crown that I'm throwing back at him was the work. My life's gift. My life was a gift to him. I gave it back to him. What are you going to have to throw at his feet? I'm going to move on, friend, but some of you need to seriously think about that. What are you going to give back to Jesus? Boy, I'd hate to on that day. Because I lived my whole life for myself. Just me, 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 me. Built my kingdom, did my stuff. My little family, my trips, my this, my that, my clothes, my car, my house, my pool, my this, my that. My money, my bank accounts, my retirement. Then you die. Jesus looks at you and says, where's my crown? Just junk, just paper. Just think what it's going to be. Oh, you made it. Good for you. Good for you. But the blood, you made it. The blood, the cross, you made it. But I want to be able to look at people in the eyes. I want to be able to look at Paul. I want to be able to talk to Elijah. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to have done something. So at the marriage supper of the Lamb, if we're fellowshipping up there, I have something to talk about. consequences for those of you that have made a decision in 1998 not to drink anymore maybe you did that because of cirrhosis of the liver alcohol hepatitis I've prayed for enough yellow skinned people in this place friend and I'm not talking about foreigners I'm talking about folks that have come in here with alcohol alcoholism disorders cirrhosis hepatitis you look at a man and they look, like, they look like ghosts. What is it? Years and years of alcoholism. You want to know what that is? That's a consequence. And how many resolutions did they make at the turn of the year? I'm never going to drink again. I'm never going to drink again. I'm never going to drink again. And here they are at Brownsville, hoping that God will heal their body because the doctor's only given them two months to live. If you're here tonight, maybe God will heal you, but I want to tell you something, sir. I want to tell you something, ma'am. You better live from this moment on the rest of your born days for Jesus. The, the, the consequences of alcoholism, alcohol psychosis, brain damage. If you're pregnant and you're drinking, man, I read a story today about a woman just couldn't give up drinking. So she had a little baby. She had a little three-week baby, and she was breastfeeding the baby, drunk. And she nodded out. It's a true story. She nodded out. She was so drunk. And the baby was sucking on the milk and took too much in and began to choke. And Mama was stoned out of her mind, and she passed out. The baby literally choked and suffocated and died in her arms. Three weeks old. Think 
about the consequences of alcoholism. That's insane. She woke up with a dead baby in her arms, had choked on the very milk from her breast, but she just had to have a glass of whiskey. I'm talking about the consequences. Driving down the road, sliding off the side, hitting some kid on a bicycle. Those of you that drink in this room, it should be a nightmare to you that that would happen. And you're going to spend the rest of your days, maybe 15, 20 years, during the prime of your life, locked behind prison bars. Why? Because you just had to get a six-pack with the boys. You know what's always bugged me? It's these bars all over our city here and all over the cities of America and the world. And these people are sitting in the bars all night long and they get out of the bar and walk straight to their car. Lethal weapons. And I'm thinking, why isn't there a cop standing? And maybe it's because we don't pay enough taxes. I don't know. But every bar should have, have to pay for a cop. And all they would have to do I'm telling you, it would eliminate thousands of unnecessary deaths in this nation if they just put a breathalyzer up against their mouth before they got in the car. Everybody walks out of the bar, they have to stick their mouth over that thing, and if, they, if, if it registers high, they ain't getting in no automobile. Period. Makes sense to me. And the bar should pay for it. Those of you that smoke in this room, you're going to get emphysema, lung cancer, asthma. These are consequences. Those of you that are involved sexually outside of marriage, AIDS, syphilis, gonorrhea, herpes. These are consequences. Well, I'm going to move into the scripture. and We're going to move quickly right now, so pay attention. Resolutions are so important. And as I started reading the word of God, friend, I saw them everywhere. I also pulled out some resolutions from Jonathan Edwards. Awesome resolutions. He makes 70 of them. Here's one of them. I resolve never to do anything which I should be afraid to do if it were the last hour of my life. That's powerful. Here's another one. I'm not going to read all these. It says, I frequently hear people of old age say how they would live if they were to live their lives all over again. I resolve that I will live just so as I can think I shall wish I had done supposing I live to an old age. Think about that. He was saying, if I get to be old, I want to say I wouldn't change a thing. Yeah. Now's the time to make that resolution. So when somebody comes up to you and you're 78 years old and you're walking down the road in a cane with a cane and somebody looks at you and says, Mr. Jones, what, you, what would you change if you had to live it all over again? You look at him and go, bless God, not a thing. I've served the Lord with my heart, my whole heart all my life. Some resolutions by Robert Murray McShane, the Scottish pastor. He says this. He said, the moment I see sin in my life, I resolve to confess it. He said, I resolve to flee all temptation immediately. And he said, I also resolve to spend the best hours of the day in communion with God rather than the worst hours of the day. Powerful resolutions, friend. What I'm sharing with you tonight will touch your life if you'll let it. But Joshua said this. Take these scriptures down, note takers. Joshua 24, 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, be it resolved that we will serve the Lord. Now you listen. I'm going to add those three letters, theologians and scholars here. Just bear with me. It's okay. I'm going to add the words be it resolved because that's what these were. These were resolutions. Joshua was standing before the people and said, Bubba, do what you want. But look at me. Look in my eyes. As for Steve Hill, Jerry Hill, Ryan, Shelby, and Kelsey and their pets. <laughs> We're going to serve the Lord. We're going to go after God with all our heart, soul, and strength. How about you? 
Isaiah 50 verse 7. For the Lord God will help me, therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore be it resolved. Have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. I love these, friend. I love Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am persuaded. That is a resolution. He could say, be it resolved that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I love people like that. I love confirmations like that. Shh. Psalm 101, verse 2. Be it resolved, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I love this, verse 3, 101, verse 3, Psalms. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Is anybody listening tonight, friend? Everybody wants the power, but nobody wants the discipline. The power comes through the discipline. The power comes through this. How on earth do you think God's going to anoint you if you can't keep your mind out of a playboy? If you can't walk to a Walmart or a Kmart or a Circle K and keep your mind off the Cosmo magazines and all the other women's magazines that are on the rack, if you can't get your eyes off that, how do you expect God to anoint you? The psalmist made a resolution. I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. Whew. Then in one Matthew 16, I'm moving quickly, friend, maybe too quick. Matthew 16. When Jesus said to Simon, who the people say that I am, and Simon Peter said, Thou art the Christ the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. See, some of you in this room, everyone looked this way, you're still not convinced that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You want to know why I can say that? Because you still believe in all the other religions of the world. You say, well, how can a million, how can a billion Muslims be wrong? I mean, are you saying that all those Muslims are wrong? See there, friend? I had some Mormons over at my house the other day, and, you know, you know, they seem to be really good people, and they got good families, and they're helping one another, and, and surely they're all going to heaven too. The other day we had a whole row of Mormon elders right here. When was that, Saturday night? Friday night. Came to check out the revival. They used to do that in Argentina all the time. They used to come and just sit there with their badges on and check out the power. But you haven't firmed up, friend, that he's the Christ. Somebody comes walking up to you and shares some other religion, twists the gospel a little bit, and you start bellying up. You start getting weak. How do I answer this man? How would I say? Friend, if you don't know how to answer somebody, look him in the face and say, I really don't know the answer to that question. But what I can tell you is this. I once was blind, but now I see. I once was lost. No problem. I once was sad, but now I'm happy. I once couldn't sleep, and now I snore. You know, whatever. That's the kind of stuff that messes with people anyhow. You know? Because they're standing there. They got insomnia. They can't sleep at night. And you're going, I sleep like a baby because he, he gives his angels charge over me. They can't stand that kind of stuff. They want to argue doctrine. You want to, you want to share experience. Shh. But Jesus said to Peter, I say also unto thee, be it resolved that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And be it resolved, I will give unto everyone in this church the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever you loose on earth it shall be loosed in heaven Jesus Jesus was not hesitating when he said that 
He looked into their beady eyes and he said, listen to me, boys. Can you hear them? The keys to the kingdom. Well, I'm going to share a few resolutions and then we're going to pray together tonight. Those of you, by the way, that are away from God, he's in this place. The gospel has been sung already in song. But I want, to, I want you to know, Jesus died for you. Now, the man I'm about to talk about for the next few minutes before charity comes to say, the reason he did what he did and was able to do what he did is because of these resolutions I'm about to share with you. See, Jesus had his mind made up from the foundation of the world. He had a plan. I love people that carry out the plan. I love people that go forward and complete the task. See, God is like that. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. He never stops working on you, friend. He's going to complete the project. How many uncompleted projects do you have sitting around the house, sir, ma'am? How many half-knit sweaters and half-knit socks do you have sitting in the drawer? But God finishes his socks. He finishes his sweaters. You know? He goes all the way, friend. And Jesus, 2,000 years ago, went all the way to Calvary for you. See, you have a sin problem. Everyone in this room has a sin problem, including the preacher. Someone had to die for that. Someone had to die for it. You learned that when you were a little kid. When you do wrong, you feel rotten. It's a natural thing. You don't have to be a Christian to understand that. A kid that does wrong in any culture of the world feels bad. I'll never forget a little boy coming running up to me in Argentina. I don't see a copy of Stone Cold Heart, but he had a he had a copy of Stone Cold Heart. That's all right. He had a copy of in Spanish Stone Cold Heart, and he came running up to me. The kid was like five or six. I mean, just a little runt. Okay. He comes running up to me. He goes he goes Pastor, Pastor. He said Lee to libro. He said I read your book, and he said. I'm the one. I'm the one. I said, what do you mean? You're the one? He goes, I'm the one. I've been stealing cookies out of the cookie jar. <laughs> and you're reading the book in chapter one, I believe it is, two voices at the cookie jar. And he was squalling, man. This kid was a mess. He goes, I've been stealing cookies from the cookie jar. That's me. That's me. That's me. I thought, dear God, how could you? <laughs> Go to hell. Go directly to hell. Do not pass. Go. <laughs> it's over for you, boy. How old are you? Six. Oh, there's no hope. No, friend. <laughs> I looked at him. I said, son, I know. I got on my knees. I said, I know exactly what you're going through, man. You feel rotten, don't you? <laughs> and I said, and we talked about confession and all this kind of stuff. He asked Jesus into his heart. Then he went back home and told his mama, confessed all his hideous sins, got right with God. What is that, friend? The kid read the written word is what he did. He read the book. He read what, what sin is. He felt rotten. And he, he knew he had to get it out. It's a natural thing. And those of you in this room that you've done wrong, you know you got to get that off of you. If you're carrying it around. That kid was carrying around that sin. And God set him free. He will set you free tonight, friend. Jesus Christ will set you free. He came to destroy the works of the devil. He did that. And he came to die for the sin of the world and also to keep you from hell. Don't forget John 3, 16, that whosoever believeth in him should not. That's, an important, that's a judgment scripture, you know. Everybody says, well, it's a lovely love verse. Yeah, friend, but it's, you were going to perish. You can preach on hell with that verse. You were going to perish. That's why Jesus came. Let me share with you a few resolutions and charity is going to sing. Number one. These are the resolutions of Jesus, be it resolved. I will not yield to temptation. Everyone in this room, you're going to make these resolutions this year. Be it resolved. You're going to determine you will not yield to temptation. Now, you can write this scripture down, Luke 4, 1 through 13. You remember when Jesus was tempted? He had been fasting, being 40 days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. That's... Chapter 4, verse 2 of Luke. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone be become bread. And Jesus said, It is written. The Bible does not say that Jesus wavered. He said, It is written. And when the devil brought him up to a high place, he said, Everything out here I'll give to you, Jesus. And he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. 
You want to know that is, friend? He had made up his mind not to yield. Now, I'm moving quickly on this, so stay with me. Not to yield to temptation. Now, let me tell you about temptation. There's an old German divine Christian said this. You cannot prevent, this is temptation, you cannot prevent the birds from flying over your head, but you can prevent them from making nests in your hair. All right? That's temptation, okay? Temptation's always going to be out there buzzing around. But you've got to keep moving, okay? You've got to keep moving. Point in case, you're at Walmart. I use Walmart alone because that's just sort of America's hangout. You're at, you're at Walmart. And if you're from another country, it'll be there soon. Trust me. <laughs> They're, they were in Argentina, weren't they? They're everywhere, man. <laughs> but you're in Walmart, and you stop at the checkout counter. On one side are a lot of lewd magazine covers. On the other side is Juicy Fruit. If you'll turn around, friend, and look at the Juicy Fruit and the Tic Tacs and the Snicker Bar, well, you might fall into temptation with the Snicker Bar. But if you, <laughs> if you, keep, if you keep your eyes high, you'll just see Tic Tacs, and they're good for your breath. Just keep your head high. But that's moving around. That's keeping the birds from landing in your hair. Another Englishman said this, I cannot help it if the devil comes to my door. I cannot help it if he lifts the latch and he walks in. I can help it if I offer him a chair. All right? Sometimes the devil gets close. But you don't have to say, come sit down with me. Keep him moving. You looking around for something, Bubba? You ain't going to find it here. There's the back door. You came in. Go back out where you came from. <laughs> Have you determined in your heart to not allow the lies of the devil to permeate your armor? Have you resolved not to yield to temptation? Drug addicts, listen to me. You don't resolve not to yield to temptation when you're in the middle of the crack house. You resolve way before then. You don't resolve to quit drinking while you're hanging out in front of the Budweiser counter. You quit drinking before that. And then when you walk up to the, the Budweiser and the Miller, you walk right by it and you get yourself a Diet Coke. You deal with it, friend, way ahead of time. Is anybody listening? I hope so, friend. Jesus won the battle with the devil far before the time in the wilderness. He had already made up his mind why he had come. I hope you're listening because this, this may sound so, I mean, even naive or juvenile to some of you, but some of you men out here, you go, well, I don't need anything like this, but you yield to some of the most ignorant stuff. For example, you get an off day, a free day, a Saturday, a Saturday night, whatever, and you get this little remote control jobby and you can't even control your finger. And he keeps clicking those channels. And you hit on an R-rated movie. And you're so strong, you're so holy, but you can't seem to get the thing moving again. And there you are, watching the R-rated movie just to see how bad it really is. It's bad, okay? It was bad before you watched it. It was bad the last time you watched it. You know what your problem is? You haven't made up your mind. You have to make up your mind before you ever click the channels, friend. This is the way it works. I'm trying to lay a foundation by the help of God for 1998 that will get you out of that rut. And some of us have, for the last three or four years have just been living in that just the, the scum of the earth. You get up a little while, you fly around, and you fall right back down in the mud. And the Lord's saying, enough with the mud. Get out of there. Fly. I've cleaned your wings. Fly. 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 Don't go back to the vomit. Well, I tell you what I was thinking today about preparing a message on vomit. Vomit stinks. I was going to bring some out here. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> that, the Bible talks about the dog returning to his vomit. And that's exactly what some of us do. We go right back to the same old junk, the scum of the world. The, the, some of you slept in pools of your own vomit. And you're still drinking. Hello. 
when are you going to learn? When are you going to understand that sin destroys you? See, that's why I don't yield to temptation, because it'll kill me. You want to know what a bad movie will do to Steve Hill? It'll zap my anointing, and I don't want my anointing to be zapped. I don't want to lose the anointing. You want to know what looking around at other women will do to Steve Hill? It'll ruin my family. It'll destroy my family. It'll destroy my faith that my son has in me. He's watching me. Ryan's here tonight. Wave at me, buddy. I love you, son. You're my pride and joy. Shelby, wave at me, baby. I love you, honey. I love my kids. Kelsey's somewhere. <laughs> but I love these kids, and they're watching Daddy. Every move he makes, and I've made a decision. I'm going to be there when they graduate from school. I'm going to be their daddy when they graduate from school. They're going to be proud of me when they go into college. I'm going to be there. When they grow up and get a job, I'm going to be there. When they need counsel, I'm going to be there. I'm not going to be one of these wishy-washy fathers that breaks up with his wife because he wants another girl, because he wants this, he wants that. I'm not going to be one of those lazy men that never prays at home, that never talks about Jesus. I've made up my mind. I'm going to follow after God. See, it's a decision. It's a decision. This is disturbing some people here. I can feel it. I heard today of a man that fell, and I thought, let's see here, a man has children, wife, children. Let's see, how, how much did, he probably had about 30 minutes of pleasure with some woman, about 30 minutes, and he lost everything in 30 minutes. Thir everything. It's all gone. A respected ministry, and I'm talking highly respected. A family, kids that believed in him, all of it's gone. That's crazy. That's insane, friend. It doesn't compute. You heard what I talk about resolutions. There better be some consequences out there. Don't quit drinking, you'll die of cirrhosis. Don't quit running around with women, running around with other men, you might have catch gonorrhea or herpes or AIDS. Sin will destroy you. Jesus saw it for what it was, friend. Sin will promise you everything and leave you with nothing. How many know that's true? Sin will promise you heaven on earth and give you eternity in hell. Sin will love you for a season and curse you for eternity. Sin will separate you from God. It'll enslave you and it'll end in death. Well, another resolution of Jesus. I'm moving quickly. Trust me on this, friend. I've skipped a lot of notes. I will do the will of my Father. I will do the will of my Heavenly Father. These are resolutions of Jesus. He was not going to yield to temptation. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be a Christian. Leonard Ravenhill used to say to me all the time, do you want to be a Christian, Steve? I said, yes, I do. I want to be on fire for God. He said, then better, better, you better be ready to be tempted of the devil. Be ready to go through... 40 years of fastings and, and, and temptation, 40 days of fastings and temptations. Be ready, Steve, to, to have your social life destroyed. Be ready to have your best friends turn on you. To ready, be ready to have a Judas in your life. I'm talking about the man who made these red. This is why he stood the test, friend. Whew. I will do the will of my Heavenly Father. What are your plans for 1998, friend? Is God in the picture? He better be the picture. In John 9, verse 4, Jesus said, I must, not I think I might. He said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Are you one of those that you're going to do the will of God as long as things are going well? And as soon as a little adversity comes, you fall away. I'm so sick of wimps, friend. I'm sick of them. Bible school students, look at me. I'm sick of it. If you're going to be a wimp, go home. Go away. Do something else. Go wash cars down at Bebo's or something. But get out of our lives if you're going to be a wimp. 
I want to be out in battle fighting some fight and have some, some soldier out there wimp out on me because he's scared of the battle. He loved to praise and worship, but boy, he can't handle one little test. See, Jesus was convinced to do the will of the Father during the hard times also. You know, there was times of great miracles, and I am moving quickly through this. In Mark chapter 1, you'll read in verse 33, the whole city came out to see Jesus. The whole city came out to see Jesus. Now, this is my next point. Hold off on that one. That's my next point. But during the hard times, you remember when Jesus, in Matthew 26, 39, he was in the garden. He was praying. He turned around to his boys and he said, can't you stay with me just a few minutes? They couldn't stay with him. So he went off and prayed by himself. And he said, oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, you want to know what that word means? Be it resolved. Not as I will, my God, but as thou wilt. During the hard times, he was determined to do the will of God. How about it, friend? Are you going to hang in there, students, when it's exam time? Are you resolved to do the will of the Father when Mike Brown pulls you in because of some sin? I tell you what, there's some of you that are so wimpy when it comes to a little sin. Somebody nails you about something, pride wells up. And you go, who are you to talk to me about that? Who are you to talk to me about that? I don't have a problem with lust. I'll have you know I saw you staring at that girl for about 10 minutes. I was hoping you'd take your eyes off of her, but you didn't for 10 minutes while she was dancing. Who are you to talk to? How come you weren't worshiping God? You know, that, I, we've seen this kind of stuff, friend. And my answer, Mike, if somebody ever says that to you, my answer is, because I was watching you. I'm over you. And I was watching you because I'm trying to protect her from wolves like you. Yeah. <sighs> when are you going to determine... To live for God when, when you're, and I'm picking on the students just for a minute. I know some of you are here tonight. When you fall in love with one another and it ain't God right now. And one of the staff come up to you and say, listen, we don't believe this is the Lord. You're going to well up inside or you're going to humble yourself and do the will of the Father. You came to the Bible school to study. Hello? Remember how excited you were about Jesus before you met her? How excited you were about Jesus before you met him? Now you're more excited about him and her than you are about Jesus. Something's wrong. Number three, I will spend time with my heavenly father. This is a resolve. Some of you in this room are seriously backslidden because you haven't done some of these things I've told you tonight. That's why you're in the muck and the mire. You've let your guard down when it comes to spending time with the Father. This revival is wonderful, friend, but this revival won't save Steve Hill. On that final day, he's not going to call me and say, boy, you prayed so much in that revival. Good for you. No, friend, yeah, we prayed for a lot of folks in that revival, but that's not one-on-one -on -one time with God. I have to get alone by myself with my Jesus. I have to spend time with my Father alone. So when you get, when revival breaks out, don't just sort of brush it all off and say, well, I've spent time with Jesus. It doesn't work like that, friend. I will spend time with my heavenly Father. Think about it, friend, in Mark 6, 46. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. Jesus was always praying. Say that with me. Jesus was always praying. Say it again. Jesus was always praying. He prayed at his baptism in Luke chapter 3, verse 21 and 22. The Bible says, and Jesus also being baptized and praying. 
the heaven was open. I wonder why the heaven was open. Because he was baptized? Maybe not. Maybe because he was being baptized and praying. Sort of skipped that part, didn't we? Before selecting his apostles in Luke chapter 6, read it for yourself, how he went off and prayed. At his transfiguration in Luke chapter 9, Jesus was praying. In Gethsemane, I read before, Matthew 26, Jesus was praying. And this is a point I had you write down before in Mark chapter 1. In the midst of miracles, stay with me just for a minute, please. This is another reason some of you have backslid. In the midst of miracles, signs, and wonders, when Jesus had everyone at the door, the whole city pastor had come out to be with him. That's a time to kick back and go, wow, God's with me. The Bible says in Mark 1, verse 35, verse 33 says that the city was gathered together at his door and he, were, he performed all kinds of miracles, the scriptures say. And then in verse 35, and it says, And in the morning, rising up a great wall before day, Jesus got his disciples together, went out, had breakfast at Shoney's, and they talked about the night before. <laughs> no, they didn't, friend. He got up by himself and prayed. In the midst of a mighty revival, he gets away. Why? He had learned the devil will attack you. The devil's always waiting at the foot of the mountain, D.L. Moody said. Well, I'm going to close with these right here. Charity, where you at? You ready for another year? Can you sing it a couple hundred more times? Good. Boy, she'll come back there sometimes. She'll go, she'll go, Steve, I'm losing my voice. That's fine, Charity, right now, but in two hours, you better be ready. <laughs> I mean, there, there ain't no mercy on this platform, friend. I mean, don't tell us you're sick, all right? Because we like, we, we'll throw up, then we'll come out here, you know, and just, we'll come out queasy, you know, we'll have every flu you've ever had, too. But we're here. That's how the flu spreads so much, you know, we're here. <laughs> Oh, I love the soldiers that work in this revival. Well, it's awfully early, but I'm going to close with these. Number four, I will, not, I will not allow any present circumstances. I wrote this this morning, friend, and you better pay attention to it. I will not allow any present circumstances or any demon from hell to spiral me into a state of depression. I'll tell you, friend, you had better pay attention to this because this is from God this morning. I will not allow my present circumstances or any demon from hell to spiral me. How many understand what that is? You think about it, 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 think about it, think about it, think about it, think about it. You're in the Mari pit. Why? Half the time you're thinking about things that are never going to come to pass. But you've allowed the demons from hell to put all that junk on you. I would have now allowed any demon from hell to spiral me into a state of depression. That's all depression means. Is to come to, it means to cause to sink to a lower position. The Lord told me this morning out of Isaiah 35 verse 3, Strengthen ye the weak hands, Isaiah 35 3, and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. God with a recompense, that means a retribution. He will come and he will save you. That's a resolution from God. It's Isaiah 35, 3. Pastor, if you haven't preached that, that's a good one right there. That will preach. I will not allow any present circumstances. You think about it, friend, and I'm not going to spend a long time on this. But when Jesus couldn't get his own disciples to stay with him in prayer, rejection by your friends, think about it. 
Wouldn't even pray with him. Wouldn't even stay with him. It wasn't that important to him. You ever had something important to you and your people wouldn't? You ever wanted a prayer meeting, pastor, and the men won't show up? Jesus had a prayer meeting. The men wouldn't show up. They were too tired to get up for the prayer breakfast. How about it? Jesus could have spiraled into depression, Richard. He could have fallen down and gone, oh, God, man, the select men you've given me won't even stay with me. But he didn't. What did he do? He went and prayed anyway. He went and got alone by himself. And until those of you in the ministry learn that the ministry is alone anyhow, you're always going to be alone. We are surrounded here with people, but we're all alone. John Kilpatrick's alone. Mike Brown's alone. Richard Crisco's alone. Kerry Robertson. We're all alone. Lyndall Cooley's alone. You'll always, the loneliest thing in the world, the ministry. It's you and Jesus. That's what it boils down to. You and Jesus. You have all kinds of friends, but the bottom line, Pastor, you know what I'm talking about. It's you and Jesus. It's you and Jesus. Just when you think your best friends are with you, they'll turn on you. It boils down to you and Jesus. Remember John the Baptist? Boy, just take a note of this and we're going to close. Oh, no, I've said that 18 times. I'm sorry. All right? The death of John the Baptist. Mark, Matthew 14. Think about this time where Jesus, the man who came before him, a time where Jesus could allow the devil to just whip him into a depressive state. The Bible says in verse 13, Now when Jesus heard it, he withdrew from there in a boat to a lonely place by himself. And when the multitudes heard of this, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when he went ashore, he saw a great multitude and felt compassion for them. And he healed their sicknesses. He healed their sick. Jesus was not going to allow even the death of one of his best friends to stop him, friend. He turned right around and had compassion on the multitude. Resolve right now, friend. Jesus had a reason, friend, all the way through to get depressed. Hello? All the way through, he had a reason to be depressed. There's a lot here in the garden. Want to know why some of you don't get, why you get depressed so easily? Because you, this, I know this is basic, but you think on the wrong things. My staff is here tonight, and they will testify to you, and some of them work with me for years, I'm never depressed. Am I, Ronnie, do I get depressed? Angie, I mean, Doug, I'm just, Jeff, I'm just, I don't get depressed. I don't, I'm not, I don't walk in and go, oh, God. Why? Because I don't think on negative things. I don't think on negative things. I don't think on horrible circumstances. What's going to happen here and what's going to happen there? The Bible says in Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue or excellence, if there be any praise, think on these things. If you're in depression, if you're depressed, friend, don't watch soap operas. That's not the good things. Don't watch them if you're up. Just don't watch them. They will depress you. Be it resolved, friend. Well, I hope, you're, I hope everybody's listening tonight because it's, it's such a... Um, see, there's such a war to be fought and a battle to be won every day. We can't afford one soldier in this building to be sitting on some bench somewhere or lying in some hospital ward depressed. It just... You know, every once in a while, my, my son and I will watch these war, these war uh, documentaries you ever watch them things? And we'll sit there because it's history, you know, and we'll see World War II. And I was watching one the other day with Ryan. And uh, I was watching these men, Pastor, fighting, and it was, it was the Vietnam War. And they were filming it. And I was going, I'm watching people die. This is the real footage. And I was watching these people die, and, and there was two guys talking to one another. They were buddies. 
You could tell they were just sort of chatting. Then they got up with their guns and they started running forward and a grenade blew up in the face of his buddy. And the man looked down, grabbed his gun, and took right towards the enemy. Didn't even stop. The kid was gone. He had been blown to smithereens. It was over. It's obviously he had died. And, and I, I looked at that and I thought, what a soldier. What a soldier. You know, they were trained to win. They were trained to move forward. And they were taught if your best friend dies in the field of battle, don't stoop over him and wait for the enemy to kill you too. Get up and die in battle for your friend. But don't stoop over your friend and get all depressed. Think about that. We've got military men in this room, and I know they'd agree with me. They were taught to move forward, constantly move forward in the face of battle. And some of you have one setback, and you'll sit over that thing. You go, what's it going to be like? Bill's not with me anymore. Judy's not with me anymore. Sam left the church. The biggest giving family in the church has left. What, we're gonna, what are we going to do? And God's saying, get up. Would you just go forward? I called you into the work of the ministry, and you can do it. I'm going to give you what you need to go forward. Well, last one tonight. This is it. The end. It's interesting. I got facts in the, on the machine today, Pastor. This is after the Lord told me to, to, to finish this message. Pastor wrote me from California. He said, the Lord woke me up and told me to tell you these things right here. He's confirmed them in my heart that this is what everyone needs to do. Number one, lay aside every and all sins and weights in order to finish the fight. This came in the fax machine. I went, whoa now. I like that. It was resolutions, just a couple of them, just zap, zap. And he also says, this is for everybody. The second one was quiet yourself. Don't run, get so busy over the cares and the burdens. Don't spend time defending yourself, but quiet yourself. Stand still and see what the Lord will do. I like that. My last one. I will finish the race that I have begun. Remember what Jesus said? Three words. John 19, 30. It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the spirit. Gave up his spirit. It is finished. Finish, determine, friend, that you are going to finish what you started. Determine in your heart that no matter how difficult the trial, no matter how painful the circumstances, no matter how exhausted you might be, you're going to cross over the finish line. Everyone stand. It's early. We're standing. We're standing early. These were resolutions of Jesus. Look this way. Don't be sidetracked by people walking around. Before you move your chairs, how about it, friend? You made up your mind. See, it's a real gutsy thing. It's a real gutsy thing. A man stood before me here. I've shared this story on various occasions. A man stood before me here and he said to me one night, he said, pray for me, Brother Steve. I just got a lot of sex problems, sexual problems. And I looked at him and I said, I ain't going to pray for you. I said, how old are you? He said, like 47, 48. And I said, you married? He goes, yeah. I said, look at me, sir. You're a wimp. You're a wimp. You got kids? 
Yeah. Make up your mind. You want me to pray some prayer over you that suddenly your eyes will be shielded from every demonic activity out there? It ain't going to happen, friend. God didn't make a bunch of robots. There's scriptures in the Bible like flee from temptation because he knew that he was not going to put blinders on us, that we're going to have to flee. We are going to have to move with our own feet. What does that do? That shows the commander-in-chief how serious we are about him. That's, that shows the, the Lord how serious we are. When I turn my head, the, the angels see that. The devils see that. The Lord sees that. And he goes, I like that. I like that. When you get up and pray, I like that. Look at that. That's, he's doing what he said he was going to do. He's going after me. Determined, friend. See, it's a gutsy thing. Don't wimp out on God. Don't wimp out on him. And please... Don't come squalling to them with your problems unless they're serious problems. Now, you can talk to God about anything. The Bible says that. But when you make a mountain out of a molehill, just remember you're talking to the same one that at the same time you're talking to him, there's someone being martyred across the land. There's someone in Ethiopia somewhere, somewhere that's having their hand chopped off because they believe in Jesus. They're having their head bashed in. Their child is being slain, filleted alive. That God is listening to that family the same time you're wimping out to them over some silly little prayer because you didn't get the exact car you wanted. Think about that, okay? And you're going to get depressed because you didn't get the car you wanted. And there's someone praying at the exact moment who's saying, God, please spare my six-year-old daughter from these killers. And as they pray, the killers thrust a spear right through the little daughter. And God at the same time is hearing you gripe about the model car you got. Something's wrong with this picture. Don't wimp out on God. Say, God, this car will do just fine. It's got a few May Pops on him. May Pops a tire that's going to pop any time. But that's okay, God. I can handle that. When it pops, when one of these tires pop, I witness to everyone who stops to help me. Whatever you want to do, Jesus. Whatever. I want you to move the chairs to the left and the right. Everyone else remain standing. Charity, come join me up here, sis. Charity, uh, Charity, I want to say I appreciate you. I'm going to say it now at the beginning of 1998. This should cover the whole year, okay? I appreciate you, sister. Everybody appreciate Charity. Yeah. Listen, sometimes, sometimes we get going so, it gets so busy around here that we forget some of the most precious people. And I never forget you, but sometimes I forget to thank you. So... Thank you for the whole year. <laughs> there, anybody else? Richard, you're the best, brother. January 7th, 1999, I'll say it again, okay? <laughs> and if you're one of those that has got to be pampered all the time, grow up just a little bit. Matter of fact, David Ravenhill's with us tonight. And he's written a book. Is that out yet, brother? Is it on the tables? It needs to be if it's not. If you don't have a copy of it, for God's sake, grow up. That's the name of the book, okay? And you can just imagine what's inside it. But um, if you're one of those that you've always got to be pampered, always got to be loved on, someone's always got to be, you know, speaking something wonderful into your ears to make you happy, grow up a little bit. Just grow up a little bit. And uh, try to live without some of that stuff, okay? I need to give you some of our hate mail, let you read it and answer it sometime. <laughs> we get some wild stuff, man. I got one the other day. I know who you are. I mean, there's people that go, you're the Antichrist. <laughs> yeah. the, the, the other day, we get some stuff, friend. 
The other day there was a tabloid magazine, and I'm confessing, I looked at the front of it, and it was just, it was wild, and, and on the front of it said, Antichrist to come out of the southeast. That was, a, that was the headlines. I thought, oh boy, now people are going to go, yeah, Antichrist coming out of Brownsville. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Wild stuff. How did I get on that? Huh? Hate mail. Yeah, you ought to read some of our hate mail. It'll throw you into depression if you believe it. You know? But I look at that and you feel so sorry for people. You know? You get one letter that says, my entire family was transformed, my granddad was saved, my mama was saved, my husband saved, my young son's off of drugs, my daughter uh, broke up with her uh, unconverted boyfriend, and all, all these miracles. And then another person says, I can't believe you're not preaching the gospel down there. You need to preach Jesus. And you're going, this one says, we all gave our lives to Jesus. This other one says, you're not preaching Jesus. It's hilarious, friend. But you can get depressed if you concentrate on the negative. Concentrate on the positive. Right now, here's what we're going to do. Everyone in this room that has anything in their life between you and Jesus, it's time, tonight's the night, to get right. Even if you're going to be here for a few nights, there's a ton of folks coming tomorrow that are not here tonight. Don't be doing that, going, well, tomorrow I'll get right, and the next night I'll get right. No, friend, tonight's the night. This is your night. You don't have a guarantee of tomorrow night, by the way. Nobody does. Tonight is your night. Those of you in this room that are backslidden, everyone listen up. Don't be distracted. I see a lot of eyes just sort of moving around. Look this way, please. You're here tonight and you're backslidden. You're away from God. Maybe you've slipped away from God by some of the very things that I've mentioned tonight you did not do. You did not resolve to not yield to temptation. You didn't nail these things down, so you've fallen into this and fallen into that. But tonight, you're going to nail it down. You're backslidden, but you're going to come down to these altars. You're going to give your life to Jesus. You're going to turn it over to him, and you're not going to be involved in that junk no more. Friend, you're going to do that in just a minute, backslider. How can I tell if I'm backslidden? Well, you've lost your spiritual appetite. Little things don't bother you anymore. You can watch a bad TV program, and it doesn't bother you. Let me tell you something, friend. If you can sit in a TV program and listen to cussing all the time. See, Jesus wouldn't do that. What would Jesus do? WWJD. Jesus wouldn't sit there and listen to GD, 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 GD and go, well, it's just, at least there's no nudity. He just wouldn't do it, friend. And I question your relationship with God if you can sit there and watch that. Get upset at me if you want, but take it up with the Father. Jesus spoke about purity and holiness. Well, the program's just got a little nakedness in it, Steve. Their plot is good. It's a good movie. Okay, tell that to Jesus. Matter of fact, next time you watch that program, say, Jesus, I want you to come and sit with me on the couch and I'm going to ask a blessing over this. Okay, how come people don't pray over those programs? Those of you that drink, you like social drinking, how come you don't pray at the table and say, bless these martinis? How come? Because you know something's wrong. So backsliders don't let the little things bother them anymore. You need to get to the place, friend, where every little thing grieves you. If you're doing something wrong, as soon as you begin doing it wrong, you feel bad. Then you're getting in a right relationship with God. So I'm going to give you the opportunity, backslider, to come down here quickly. Those of you in this room that have never known the Lord, I know there's many of you here. You may be like this Muslim or this Jew, raised up differently, raised up anti-Christian, but you've come here tonight. You've heard about Jesus. You've heard these guys testify that he'll come into your life. One man, the Muslim, testified from the pulpit, from the baptismal pool. He didn't believe that God loved him, that God is that, would accept him. Look at me, everybody. God will accept you. Jesus died for every single soul on the face of this globe. He'll accept you, friend. Ask him into your heart tonight down at these altars if you've never known the Lord. And those of you in this room that are religious, we're smack dab in the middle of a religious season. Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Easter. We're right in the middle of it right now. This is when America gets religious, and they do in other nations also. Religion will damn you, friend. A Christmas cantata won't save you. Being the top star of the singing Christmas tree won't save you. Leading songs in your church won't save you. 
Teaching in Sunday school won't save you. Pastoring a church won't save you. You can, you can go to hell with a communion cup in your hand and a wafer in your mouth. You can go to hell with a choir robe on. You can go to hell with a clerical collar on. You can go to hell with a certificate of ordination from the Assemblies of God hanging behind your desk. You can go to hell and be a teacher at the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry if you don't know Jesus. I'm asking you, friend, do you know him? Do you wake up in the morning with Jesus on your heart? By the way, these are the questions that caused my family to come down to this altar. My whole family's Lutheran. My whole family's Lutheran. I love the Lutherans, but Lutherans won't save you. Martin Luther can't save you. The Lutheran doctrine can't save you. The Methodist doctrine can't save you. The Assembly of God doctrine can't save you. Do you know him? Do you wake up in the morning with Jesus on your heart? My sister Marcia, my older sister, stood back there going, my Lord and my God, I don't. I don't wake up in the morning with Jesus on my heart. I don't go to sleep at night with Jesus on my heart. I don't think about him during the day. And I was saying this to the whole congregation. You're supposed to be the bride of Christ. A bride is always anticipating the groom, always thinking about the groom. And Marcia stood there going, I'm not always thinking about Jesus. Next thing you know, she's down at the altar with her husband, my older sister. Friend, I'm asking you to say, she's religious, was very religious, but she didn't have a relationship. I'm asking you right now, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you consumed with him? Now, Charity, it's getting quiet in here. Charity's going to sing Mercy Seat. Mercy is undeserved forgiveness. Now, we've had probably 300,000 people come down to these altars running from everywhere. This year, there's times, well, this last weekend, this building was full, the chapel was full, the cafeteria was filling up when we got up here to preach. There's times this place is so jammed, and it will be all through this year. There's times it just packs out, and I'll be preaching and saying what I'm saying here, and in the cafeteria, which is a long way from here, on a screen, somebody will be watching in the back row, and when charity begins to sing, they'll run to the front of that cafeteria and they'll get on their knees and ask Jesus. In the chapel, Richard works over there all the time. They'll flood the altars over there. People come running all the time. Why? They're sick and tired of not being right with God. They want to leave out of here squeaky clean, brand new, washed in the blood of the Lamb. How about it, friend? How about it, friend? This is how it's going to work. Charity's going to sing Mercy Seat. When she does, when she begins, you're going to come quickly. You're going to come quickly. Don't hesitate. And the only thing that's going to keep you back if there's sin in your life, something between you and God, is pride. And pride will damn you, friend. Pride will damn you. Those of you that are professionals in this place, you're way up there. I was talking to the governor's son of Alabama, Bob James III, yesterday at length about the state of the country. And he said, Steve, when you go after people in your messages and your books, please don't forget the legal profession. Don't forget the lawyers. We're some of the biggest liars and hypocrites and prideful people on this planet. Here was the governor's son sharing this with me. He's saying, go after us, Steve. He said, there's so much pride in our life because we're judges and lawyers. And we think we got it all wrapped up. He said, but we need to repent just like everybody else. And you may be in this place tonight and you're just like that. You're a professional. You need to repent just like everybody else, friend. And here's what's going to happen. Charity's going to sing mercy seat. And if there's pride in you, pride says to you, you don't need to go down there. What's your neighbor going to think? What's your wife going to think? What's your best friend going to think? It doesn't matter what anybody thinks anymore, friend. Ask yourself this question. Does God want me to go down there? And if the answer is yes, if you feel anything in your heart, get on down here and do business with God, period. You don't have to consult with your neighbor. In the balcony, come quickly. Down in the main floor, come quickly. Don't hesitate. If you know you're away from God, if you know there's sin in your life, if you know there's some resolutions here that you've busted wide open, and tonight you need to nail them down, and you can confirm in your heart that you're going to abide by these things. It took Jesus all the way to the end, friend. He fulfilled the commission for his life. You need to do the same thing. You need to nail it down tonight. Everyone with sin in their life, everyone who is backslidden, everyone who's away from 
from God. Everyone who's never known the Lord, I want you to come quickly right now. Come quickly right now. Don't hesitate. Hurry and get on your face before the Lord. Hurry. Hurry. In the balcony, let's go. Come on. Come on. Come on. Everything is unknown. Come on. I face the power of sin on my own. Hurry. Hurry. I did not know of a place I could go where I could find a way to heal my wounded soul. He said. the music. Everyone at the altar, stay right where you're at. Keep your heads down. Folks, I don't feel like this is a time to even, even consider hesitating. Okay? This is just not the time. There's something really serious going on here. And I want to tell you who's watching this. The devil. The demons of hell are watching this. See, he watches. Our, he watches our activities. He watches our attitudes. He watches our movements. Everyone at the altar, stay right where you're at. God's moving in your lives. I can feel it. But I want everyone else, you need to consider right now your ways. Steve, this is just too hard on me. It's too difficult. It's too... Friend, this is not hard. You're making it hard. You're making it hard. Hard was the cross. Hard was the beatings. Hard was the whippings. Hard was the cursings. Hard was the stripping nude and, and hanging on Calvary's cross. That was hard. This is not hard. This is decision time. And I want everyone in this room to do something right now. We're going to help you tonight. Everyone in this room, you're going to turn to the person next to you and you're going to ask them if they need forgiveness. Wait a minute before you do it. You're going to ask them if they need forgiveness. When someone turns to you and asks you that question, do not lie. Do not lie. If there's something in your life between you and God, it could be masturbation, it could be a sexual sin, it could be anger, it could be something serious that's eating away at your spiritual life, whatever it might be, friend. There may be somebody here, you're so depressed you can't even get down here. You're so depressed. When someone turns to you and asks you, do you need Jesus Christ to forgive you? And if you're all depressed and down in the dumps because you've been thinking on the wrong things, you've been allowing stuff to get to, you turn to them and say, yeah, man. Yeah, quit, quit passing the buck and, and blaming everybody else, friend. Start looking at yourself and say, yeah, you know, I'm part of the problem that I've gotten so, that I've gotten myself in such a, a pitiful state of being. I need to, I need to repent. I need to repent. Everyone in this room, you're going to turn to the person next to you, and when you do that, and someone asks you if you need forgiveness, don't lie, and then both of you come down together. Is that clear? Everyone do it right now. Everyone do it. Come on. Come on. Come on. Yeah. 
if you just play softly. We're going to do this and close this altar call. Everyone at the altar, keep your heads down. I know the aisles are filling up. Keep your heads down in the aisles. But I'm going to do something tonight, friend. I really feel like there's some demonic warfare going on. And I'm going to bind the devil from every life in this room. I'm going to bind him. Jesus. Now, if there's satanic activity going on in your life and you know that you've been oppressed by the devil, and you know that there's been stuff going on that's di it's directly, uh, it's an attack from hell, it's been going on in your life, but you've allowed yourself to do things, involve yourself in things that were wrong, and that's how the devil's gotten a shackle on you. When I pray this prayer right now, trust me, friend, the lock is going to come undone from your life. I'm going to I'm gonna bind the devil, and when I do, you better get down here quick. Because if you know that there's something going on and you don't, then the devil sees what's going on. The demons of hell see that you're wavering. And trust me, friend, that shackle will go on even tighter. I'm going to do this. This is a favor. This is a favor. Because we could stop this altar call right now, but I'm doing this, sir and ma'am, as a favor. Because I want to see you free in 1998. Yes, Jesus. And this is how you're going to do it. As soon as I pray this prayer, as soon as I bind the devil from your life, then you come quickly. As soon as I begin praying, you come quickly. Satan, in Jesus' name, yes, Lord. I bind you. I bind every demon of hell. I bind your depressive attitude. I bind your depressive state. I, do, I bind, I bind you, devil, in Jesus' name. Come on, step out right now. Step out right now. Step out right now by the authority in the name of Jesus. God bless you. God bless you. God bless both of you young people. Step out. God bless you, son. Come on. God bless you, ma'am. Yes, come on. Come on. God bless you, sir. Come on. You lost, Lucifer. You lost. Everyone at the altar, bow your heads right now. We're going to pray. We're going to ask the Lord to forgive us, wash us, cleanse us. If you're backslidden, he'll forgive you. And I've got some good news. He's going to restore the years that the locusts have eaten.